Some historians claim that up to 85% of the population during the Middle Ages were peasants. Their working day was long, hard, and extremely difficult. For some, their day of backbreaking labour could begin as early as 3 o'clock in the morning during the summer. If you were lucky enough, or unlucky enough depending on your point of view, to avoid the high rate of infant mortality and the constant threat of deadly disease, then as a medieval peasant farmer, you had an exhausting, cruel, and short life to look forward to. Before we get into this video, if you want to learn more about all things piratical, then a vast ye you lily-livered landlubbers and heave ho your way over to our new channel, Walk the Plank, where we take a deep dive into Davy Jones' locker to learn about all sorts of topics surrounding the golden age of piracy. There's a new video every Saturday, and we really appreciate any support we can get. You can find the link in the description. And now for today's video, welcome to Medieval Madness. The majority does not rule. The word peasant as we know it today was never used by the medievals, and there is only one reference to the word in any document from the Middle Ages. It actually comes from the French word paysant, which means a person from the countryside. European peasants were an integral part of the feudal system, a custom that overshadowed medieval Europe. Feudalism dominated between the 9th and 15th centuries as a way of structuring society. At the top was the only real landowner in the country, the king, followed by his noble dukes and earls who ruled over their smaller landowners such as knights and lords, who owned manors that were populated by the peasants. It was a way of exchanging land for services because none of them actually owned any land, they were only able to use it in exchange for work, loyalty, and military service to the king. Oh lordy. There were thousands of peasant or farming communities all over Europe during the Middle Ages. Most were individual homesteads or tiny hamlets, although there were some places where enough people lived communally together that they could be called villages. The populations of these villages mostly consisted of farmers, people who ploughed fields and looked after livestock. Their dwelling places, barns and sheds were central to the village with the fields and pastures surrounding it. And this is where they lived, built a church, sinned, worked, socialised, loved, married, had children, brewed ale, drank it, got drunk, fought, became sick, or got old and died. The problem was that many of these people lived on the land belonging to the local lord. Known as serfs or villains, they were at the bottom of the medieval social hierarchy. They had to swear an oath of obedience on the Bible to their lord and were tied to his land. This meant that they were only allowed to farm a section of land allotted to them. And for this, they had to give their lord a percentage of their produce every year. Effectively, they were owned by the lord for whom they worked and could only marry or move with his permission. 70% of all peasants were serfs and tied to the land in this way, and were seen as the property of the lord along with the land that they farmed. Between the years of 1229 and 1242, Thomas Earl of Warwick granted 22 parcels of land from his very large manors in Warwickshire, England. The plots were anywhere between 2 and 12 acres, and for their use, the peasants had to pay about 2 pence an acre, usually with an initial sum of anywhere between 13 shillings and 10 pounds, depending on the size. This was mostly for heathland that was uncultivated and needed to be cleared. Clearing the land was backbreaking work. For a field that was to be used for crops, trees needed to be felled. Later, stumping or removing tree stumps was especially difficult without the luxury of a modern day grinder. Some tree stumps were so difficult to remove that they might even be left in situ and the peasants would just plant around them. Other unwanted vegetation and rocks would all have to be cleared by hand. Sometimes it was necessary to dig ditches to separate one strip of land from another. Any felled trees would be hauled away either by oxen, horses, or sometimes humans, and used for firewood, fencing, or construction. Smaller pieces of wood would be gathered by the women and children to be used as kindling. Nothing was wasted. In addition, the tenants were also expected to build their own houses and barns. Not all lords tried to distance themselves from their serfs. Many villages were built at the gates of manor houses, monasteries, and castles. However, not all landlords were from noble houses, some were wealthier free farmers, or in many cases, it was the church. So the peasants had to do the actual work to sustain the monasteries and abbeys too. Let's face it, with all that praying for the souls of the workers going on, the monks wouldn't have time to do their own farming, and the peasants were just grateful that they would be allowed into heaven as a reward. Interior Design the medieval farmer's house would have a central crook to hold up the roof and a hearth for cooking and heating. 
Small with a wooden door and glassless windows, they would be extremely cold in the winter and unbearably warm in the summer. The roof was usually thatched, making it a haven for all manner of creepy crawlies. But for the most part, they were dark, smoky, smelly, and overcrowded places. Many didn't even have any windows, and because livestock was so precious, cattle and sheep would be brought indoors to share the living space, often being apportioned up to a third of the indoor area. Furniture would be quite basic, and floors were made from earth and straw. As a consequence, bedbugs, lice, and fleas were a huge problem, and you can bet it didn't smell too nice either. Man's work. Men spent most of their time in the fields either sowing, managing, or harvesting their crops depending on the time of year. Any livestock that the family owned needed to be tended to. In addition to this, several days would have been assigned to work for their lord. This might be for building projects at the manor or for labor on the lord's private garden or vegetable plot. Up to 50 or 60 days a year might be given over to the lord's requirements. Other necessary jobs included the regular collection of firewood, and they might also be involved in other trades and crafts such as woodworking or smithing. In villages, roads, hedges, and thatches had to be repaired, and communal buildings such as churches also needed to be maintained. The farming itself was endless toil, and there was always something that needed doing. The whole village could face starvation in the winter if the harvest failed. It was an endless and monotonous cycle of plowing, sowing, planting, reaping, and threshing. The most common produce was rye, oats, barley, and peas. They could all be planted and harvested by hand using tools such as spades, wooden plows, scythes, and sickles. Women's work. This didn't mean that female peasants didn't bear their share of the work, and they would probably get up earlier than the men to prepare their breakfast of pottage before they left for the fields. In an age where there were no dishwashers, vacuum cleaners, or washing machines, peasant women had a myriad of labor-intensive jobs to complete too. Not having running water in the house didn't help the situation. Because water needed to be carried from the local river or well, clothes were often taken down to the river or stream to be washed there rather than at home. Stained clothing had to be soaked for many hours and then physically beaten and pounded with a wooden washing bat or stick before being wrung out and left to dry on bushes and trees. Having to go to all that trouble of carrying water usually meant that bathing was not a priority, and with all of that sweaty manual work, it would only add to the indoor stench. Women were responsible for cooking the two main meals of the day. This included having dinner ready for the field workers at midday, and then preparing a light supper in the evening. Women usually ate last, after their husband and children were fed. During harvest time, women would also go into the fields themselves and help with gathering crops. Some even took on the male role of farming themselves in some circumstances, such as widowhood or if their husband was incapacitated through illness. Small animals, such as domestic fowl, needed to be fed and their eggs collected. Women would also collect berries and herbs to add to their dishes and brews, as well as for use in medicines. Women contributed to essential trading and crafting industries, such as baking, brewing, and manufacturing textiles. With clean water often being in short supply, beer was an essential part of the peasant diet, as was bread. For this, flour was needed, and the mill was owned by the lord of the manor, who charged a fee for its use. In one small farming community named Rooslip, which is now part of North London, Alice the widow of Salvage was a brewer in the 13th century. The shepherd had a mistress named Agnotta, and Hugh Tree's sheep kept escaping and getting into the lord's garden. Dangerous Times as well as all this drudgery, women were responsible for caring for the younger children, who would in turn work for their parents as soon as they were physically able, but only if they could survive long enough. 20% of women died whilst giving birth, and a staggering 50% of children died within the first year of their life. Children would work either on the land or in the household, depending on their age and gender. They would start with small tasks such as bird scaring, but by the age of 12, boys were expected to go out into the field and work with their fathers. Many parents couldn't afford to keep their children at home, so they would be sent off to live and work in more affluent households. They would usually leave in their early teens to become a servant, and stay until they were in their early 20s, leaving to possibly marry and establish their own farming household. Women who worked within the Lord's household didn't have a much easier life either. In his manuscript, The Husbandry, that the agronomist William of Henley wrote around 1280, he describes how a manor should be managed. One chapter discusses the duties of a dairy maid and how much was expected from her. Quote, It is always good to have a woman there, at a much less cost than a man, to keep the small animals there and what there is within the court, and answer for all products there as a woman would. 
That is to say, when the sows farrow for their pigs, for peacocks and their chicks, if there are any, for geese and their goslings, for capons, cocks, hens and their chickens and eggs. And she ought to answer for half of the winnowing of the grain also. Most peasants didn't have the luxury of free choice. Their lives were harsh and governed by hard physical work. Their homes were far from luxurious, and their women faced overwhelming hardship, risking their lives during childbirth. Their children were at even greater risk of dying. But really, with the nobles busy fighting wars and the church occupied with praying for everyone, it was the hard work of the peasants that kept the country running. Is it any wonder then that uprisings such as the Peasants' Revolt of 1381 and Jack Code's Rebellion in Kent in 1450 became increasingly common? Thank you for watching this episode of Medieval Madness. Don't forget to check out our new channel, Walk the Plank, and I'll see you next week for another video. Cheers.